Welcome, everybody, to the Win Again Club Room. My name is Mark Moyer, and I am super excited to have Jelani Jenkins in the house tonight. He is going to talk to us about a whole variety of things, his career in the NFL, and also, um, but most importantly, what he's doing now and postseason. So um, without further delay, I'm going to ask Jelani to come in and join me in here. Jelani, welcome. And the very first thing I want to jump into is, you know, I know that you were uh, – I believe you were raised uh, in Maryland and you went to high school there. But the one thing yeah. that really stands out, to, actually, no, I'm going to ask you, what do you feel was your greatest accomplishment in high school? Oh, it's accomplishment in high school. Um, I mean, I think overall, I ended up having over 60 Division I scholarships and ended up choosing the University of Florida out of out of a top five of like USC, Notre Dame, Stanford, and Penn State. I think my biggest accomplishment was just the amount of opportunity I had to have those scholarships based off of being um, like one of the top five high school players in the country. And I think also when I look back, I see like I was one of the first – guys who was able to get drafted to the NFL from my high school, bringing all of the notoriety to high school based off of my recruiting process, was able to have people like Stefan Diggs be found, um, Lewis Young, um, Kendall Fuller. I, I, afterwards, a lot of making it to the NFL. So I think that's what I'm most proud of the new to show the amount of talent that exists in the Maryland area. Well, you forgot one thing that I'm going to mention. I did well, some that... digging. I actually went to your high school and I interviewed him. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but I, <laughs> now that would be something. Um, no, but That's you were cool. a defensive player of the year. At the same time, you were student athlete of the year. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. that? Now, to me, um, I'm impressed yeah, with the student yeah, athlete of the year. Because that means it had the word student in it. Yeah. Tell yeah. me about your my studying parents, and yeah, go ahead. Tell me about them. Yeah. My, my parents were really, really big on it. Um, when I was getting calls almost every day from all these schools, I it had to like filter through them. There was like a little 45 minute mark that they were able to like reach me. But other than that, I'd be in there studying. I was one of those like jocks that would up of my homework they would copy off of my <laughs> test but I was the I was the job um and I don't know I kind of I took pride in it and I thought I felt like I was being competitive like I was in the football field but being competitive in the school and I yeah. same yeah. kind of drive um but I, I would say it all came down to just the the values that was instilled in me by my parents well it's fantastic and that you know I, I've read that uh, your dad as an architect and your mom though i love this a black belt yeah oh yeah. my god she kicks butt she <laughs> kicks butt she kicks butt yeah she really does she uh, she tells me stories about growing up in atlantic city and she used to like carry her purse out like wanting something so she can use her karate on oh my god that's hilarious yeah, yeah. i love that she, she, well she, now that also explains butt. why you're so fast you're trying to evade <laughs> you're right you know? <laughs> I had to run away I from remember that. When, I, when I was trying to stay away from my dad, I'd be like, <laughs> also same thing. Um, but anyway, so, you know, you were, uh, you were drafted into the NFL, which is awesome. You, well, you played at Florida um, and then had a great career there, but then you drafted into the NFL. You played for five seasons. Um, I noticed that one of the things that I wanted to ask you about sort of statistically was that there was one season you had a few sacks. Um, all, I, all I'm curious about is, if you know you've, you've been out there for a couple of years you're running around making all kinds of tackles but you finally you make your first career sack what mm -hmm. what was that like tell me about that moment and who was it i think my first career sack might have been against um matt stafford with the lions when he was with the lions and yeah it was one of those moments where you know everything just kind of went quiet we were in Detroit, so I didn't hear the crowd. They weren't ah, happy right. about it. Um, right, but, right. Um, it was, you know, just adrenaline was pumping. I was excited. The team was excited about it. And, yeah, I think 
I think my next one, and this is a fun sack, it was against my favorite player growing up, one of my favorite players growing up, and that was against Peyton Manning. But I came so free. Like, no one blocked me, and he saw me so quick, and he just dropped to the ground. So I didn't get a uh. chance to, like, hit him. But I just <laughs> – I got there so fast, and I just, like, jumped over him and then turned around and just touched him on the ground. So that was my second sack. Thank uh, Did you whisper in his yeah. ear, someday you'll be pitching Caesar's Sportsbook? Uh, <laughs> he's everywhere I, had, I didn't have that, the right? force. Yeah, I didn't have the foresight, unfortunately. Well, look, I want to spend a lot of time uh, actually focusing on not just what you're doing today, but your transition out of your sport. Uh, we can, uh, you know, do the ESPN thing and talk about all kinds of uh, NFL stuff and collegiate football and so forth. But really today, what I want to talk about is the whole point that, of, of what you're doing, right? And uh, what you plan on doing going forward. So tell me a little bit about, you know, when you had to make that decision to retire at that time, did you have some ideas of what you wanted to do post-retirement or were you sort of still in the dark at the time? I was sort of in the dark at the time. Um, I was actually excited about the transition, excited about the opportunity to experience the world for the first time. It felt like I was a baby in a brand new world and there was a lot of opportunity. I was getting back reacquainted with my inner creative spirit. I, I started... <laughs> Camera, fell in love with that process. So I felt like I just had a lot of time and a lot of like creative energy that I wanted to let out. So I was excited initially, but my breakup from was very much so one that needed some healing. And I didn't know it at the time. So I was angry with a lot of the things that how my career ended, ended up. I was frustrated. Um, I was sort of running away from this athlete version of myself. I was like hashtag more than an athlete, but Mm -hmm. I was really running away from that part of myself. I couldn't watch football on television. And because of that, I was able to, you know, experience new things, but a large part of me still had a hole in it. And I think that is, you know, a, a year after my trip, and I feel like I was at my lowest point. It was because I was really neglecting a large part of myself, a large part of my life. I didn't, at that time, I didn't even experience, I didn't have the the tools to really experience gratitude for the ups and downs of my career and um, to be able to learn, to be able to extract those lessons to use in the next phase of life. So I would say, yeah, it was, it was, it well, was challenging. Explain to me though, when you, so you make the decision to retire and this happens by the way, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times a year uh, in the NFL, right? There's hundreds of players that retire every year. And yeah. I'd love to hear from you, you know, is there some sort of effort from the NFL saying, hey, Jelani, sorry to see you go. Let's let's have a conversation. Let's, you know, why don't you attend some meetings? Were they coming after you or was it something more where you got like some random email and you had to go through, you know, whether it was yeah. the players trust, et cetera. What was it like? It was more of the random email from the PA, mm -hmm. from the trust. I was fortunate to with the Miami Dolphins. And this is my, I played five seasons and my last season with the Dolphins was my fourth year. So I ended up right. going to a new team and kind of getting separated from it. But with the Dolphins it, club, it's, it's, it's organization by organization. The Dolphins had a really good player development person. His name is um, Caleb Thornhill. And he put together this Dolphins yep. business combine. And that was like the second year he had did it by the time I left the league. So he had really given up great, information to be able to make decisions about where which direction we want to go i didn't know at the time yet when i transitioned but there are clubs that are doing it the right way going there with the dolphins did it correctly but by the time i went to a new club and i had left that organization um i did feel completely separated from the dolphins and so i didn't reach out to them until a year later when i was really in in the dark um but no i didn't get a bunch of people reaching out trying to hold my hand through it yeah. um just got do you kind think of that would have helped emails. at all or not necessarily i think that it would have helped i think it would have helped definitely um you know it's like when you get like generic mail that you know isn't for you <laughs> it's kind of like that yeah. you know i didn't i didn't feel any personal touch to it i didn't really feel like i felt like they were kind of just checking a box you know um and I think that's kind of the sentiment 
a lot of people don't really feel connected to the resources. There are resources available that that are helpful if if we go and use those resources, but there is no level of like um, resonance. We don't really resonate with it for whatever reason. It's a disconnect, and it doesn't feel part. Doesn't feel like it's authentic. Well, I, and I think part of it is this, you know, because uh, I've I've been trying to get them to consider the idea of bringing on some people to actually make that connection, to make that phone call, to do the reach, the outreach, because once, I mean, they do have some great resources, but if you're, if you don't know about them or you're not connecting with somebody there or there's nothing happening, you know, you're going to be like, Oh, there's an email, delete, delete, whatever it is. And, yeah. but I think just a few words, a one short, a 15 minute, half hour conversation with a retiring player can make all the difference in the world in the direction that they go going forward. So yeah, we'll have to talk about that. Um, so, yeah. you know, finally, uh, so you start coming out of it. What? Tell me a little bit about what it was that kind of brought you out of that funk a little bit. Yeah. So it was asking for help. It was being vulnerable enough to ask for help, knowing that I needed it. Um, I was I'm naturally like a very peaceful person. But during that time, I was pretty stressed out, yelling more into more arguments. And there was a point when I realized that I wasn't in a good place. Um, and I reached out to Caleb. He connected me to Jim Neeson, who is a platinum member. He's a, a platinum member with Tony Robbins. Okay. And when I reached out to him, Tony Robbins had an event coming up like that next month. So he invited me to that event. I really opened my eyes up to a lot of what personally I was going through that was kind of holding me back from being my best. And it also provided kind of direction for me in a way that I was excited about. And that was coaching and like helping people out, not coaching. For not coaching for a team, but actually mm -hmm. supporting individuals. And I, um, I didn't talk much about my childhood, childhood, but my father was big on mindset and being the power of the mind. And that was that helped me be successful was those lessons that he instilled in me. So when I was able to like, find gratitude for my experience in sports, I was able to reach in there and, re and pick out the gold that I experienced that helped me be great in that. And what I found was that mindset was so important into it. And so that's what kind of led me to want to coach and support people from a, from a mental perspective. So my first, that second year when I was in retirement, that's kind of the direction I went was, was being a coach. And supporting people as yeah. a mental performance coach and i had a couple of clients doing that and then directed my energy specifically towards athletes had a online course that i tried, that i that i put together for a group coaching model and that's kind of what led me postseason that is a platform that hosts multiple online courses in the community and all those things <clears throat> and did you do that because you felt that you were, I mean, I'm assuming you were thinking you're filling a gap that really was something that's necessary, right? There's nothing yeah. that, you know, there is, really isn't a lot of that going on right now. But uh, tell me a little bit about being an entrepreneur and starting something like this and the different maybe hurdles and challenges you've faced as, you, as you've been growing this. Yeah. Well, I, I never thought I'd be a tech CEO. And so... I most of the time don't fully know what I'm doing, but I do know how to like create a team of people who are smarter than me in different areas. I know how to like empower that team. And so that's really what my job has been as CEO is, is really to form a team, um, to empower that team, share with them the vision and to allow vision to inspire all of us to move towards something greater. Um, I think the biggest hurdle for me has been just learning those lessons, like the hard lessons that that help and, and, and help me grow as a leader. Um, for example, like knowing when to let someone go who's not necessarily great for the culture earlier rather than later. Um, different things like that. I think one of the things that really helped me in this process was was the market research I did before I got started. So I actually interviewed 55 former collegiate and professional athletes and just asked them, you know, what about their transition, what did they wish was available to them? What were their biggest fears, frustrations? And yeah. that helped me grow like this real emotional connection with the audience and helped me really understand like the full demand that was there. Even around and nobody knows about it. 
there's like a large, large demand. I mean, out of the 55 athletes I spoke to, like 53 of them were in real shambles when they stopped playing the game. And um, and all and all of them thought they were the only ones going through it. That was the other thing that I realized is no Isn't one's talking to one another. It's crazy. It's we're not talking to one another. We we mm-hmm. we're in locker rooms our whole career. When we stop playing, we go into isolation, like I did, and we don't talk to one another about it. So we're all going through it. We're not talking to one another. The demand is there, and it's kind of underground. So that's when I realized, yeah. okay, I need to do something about it. You know, it's interesting. I hosted an event in here about a year or so ago where it was just myself and twelve uh, retired players, and it was remarkable to see them all open up and, you know, sort of be a little bit more vulnerable about their experiences with their transition and going through retirement. Um, And they basically said, look, you know, it's, it's, it's easy when it's in a quote locker room where it's just them, but they feel uncomfortable sharing that with, I guess, non-athletes or, or the fans or whatever it might be. So I, I completely get it. And that's, you know, it's interesting because, the, one of the biggest things when I work with athletes, they say they have a couple of regrets. One of them is that they didn't grow their network while they're still playing and meet a lot of people, especially in business and so forth. But then the second one is that they didn't reach out and take advantage of some services or some, some programs or something like what you're doing with postseason sooner uh, to really help them get out of that little bit of a funk and that sort of thing. Because, you know, as you know, when an athlete retires, suddenly their daily routine is gone. The nutrition, you know, expectations are gone. The exercise is gone. The adrenaline rush is gone. The, um, you know, the fans, the adoring fans is gone. The being on TV or in front of a great stage is gone. And suddenly they're on a couch and it might be a super nice couch and a really huge TV and a really big, beautiful house or cars or whatever it is. But when you're missing all that other stuff, it's a big chunk ripped out of you, right? And, you know, it's... You feel like no one else can really relate to what you're going through because it's a very unique experience. Um, It is. Very unique. Because, I mean, you're doing this, you're going through that at 20-something, not at, you know, 50-something or whatever it is. Wait, did I say I was 50-something? Anyway. You did. Um, You pointed to yourself, too. (laughs) Anyways. um, All right. So before we go much further, because I do want to talk a little bit more about postseason, I just want to jump in with a couple of these questions that are in the the Q&A section. You know, Matt is asking... You know, he's curious to hear some of your thoughts on NIL and, and the portal, um, because, you know, you went to Florida, obviously a big, you know, big school, amazing players there. But so now they have the opportunity to earn money with NIL and they have a chance yeah. to transfer if they want. Tell me a little bit about your feelings on NIL. Are you a supporter? Not really. How do you feel about it? Yeah, I think with the right resources, it can be very empowering for I'm always about athlete empowerment. And yeah. I think that it gives athletes the opportunity to um, leverage something that's greater than greater than sports, um, something that can help them in the next phase of life. And I think it also instills like good habits that I wish that I had. I wish that I took branding, social media, like building community serious while I was in yeah. college, while the adoring fans were there. Um, and even if they don't make a bunch of money through NIL, the habit of building brand and building community is yes. something that is going to be very powerful in the next phase of life. Mm-hmm. I think that is good in that sense. The transfer portal, I, I, don't, I don't know how much I feel about that. But it is, um, again, I, I, I'm, I'm an athlete empowerment guy. So if it's something that is empowering the athlete to be able to make decisions and leverage what they're capable of to to do what's best for them and the vision that they have it for their life, then I love it. But I, again, it takes like good resources and a good support system to get them in the right mindset to make the best decision, you know, instead of emotional, yeah. immature. Got it. Perfect. And uh, in a follow up, Laura, who's at University of Florida now, she she asked, well, how do you think athletic coaches like position coaches, et cetera, can do a better job of creating a culture that supports the players in this realm throughout their career, including the sunset seasons. So, you know, it, it's interesting and it, I don't want to answer it for you and I shouldn't, but I, I, the one thing I will say is that I think there's mixed feelings about that because I think some people say, well, a, a head coach or coach, their job is to put the best product on the field and victories, right? It's not yeah. necessarily to worry too much about what's going on inside of here. 
On the flip yeah. side, though, if they focus on what goes on in here, the product will be better on the field. Right. right? I, I agree with but, that second part. But yeah. yeah, it's I think it's by culture. Uh, you know, a great athletic director or owner of a team is going to bring individuals in there that's going to empower the player to play better on the field, but also and I think it, I think it's a top down approach. And so if you bring someone on um, them being the best on the field, that that is their job. But I, the, the 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 players, coaches that really care about the human being can do a bit more to help sure make sure that they say something even greater. And um, it's it's a it's a dime a dozen to find something like that or someone like that. But they are out there, and I think that that makes them just that much better of a coach. I would play harder for a coach who I knew cared about me, but beyond the field, for sure. And it's interesting because there's a fair share of coaches that you know they feel that they need to be feared to get better results, but that's not that's not the case. And it's something where, when you feel that, you, and this is the same when you're working, at, you know, and you're working for a boss, a supervisor, a manager who you respect but they respect you back you tend to your product your productivity increases over someone that's just reaming you out you know it's interesting um yeah 100%. so yeah yeah now um back to postseason so i know you've had a few little pivots here and there which is something that we all do with our businesses that's that's we're all trying to find well what is going to be the best mix of everything to create the best product but tell me a little yeah. bit now about what you're hoping to do with postseason as we head into 2023. So the biggest thing we want to do is provide education, community and wellness support. And through education, we to we're going to be mainly a content based platform where we are producing a premium educational content taught by athletes for athletes. So there are a, a ton of great examples of athletes who've made um, just as much, if not more success in their next phase of life. And when I speak to them, they have a huge desire to give back because they also can relate to the difficult transition. And so we want to partner with them to really um, translate their success story in their particular industry to roadmaps that other athletes can follow and walk them through a course creation process to really extract those those lessons that, that an athlete can resonate with. We really... You know, anyone who's had success beyond sports used, even if they don't realize it, they use the same things that help them be successful in the game, um, whether it's coachability, whether it's resiliency, um, confidence, visualization, mm -hmm. all these different things. And so our job is to really extract that from them. And so producing content that um, elite athletes can have an opportunity to access and be in a community with others who are going through similar transitions. You know, we want to partner with the UFs, the the, the Alabama's, Tennessee's, Division II schools to be able to the school to those student athletes, especially that first year out. They they go, I, you know, I was at UF Law and I saw that new the ninety million dollar facility that they have for the student athletes. They're in these beautiful houses with this all this support system. That next year when they stop playing, they leave that castle. Now then they're they're in the wilderness, and so we to support them when they enter the wilderness. Um, when there isn't that support system there. Wait, are you by, are you building a castle too? We're gonna build a castle for them to to jump to. So we'll build a bridge yeah, from their nice. castle to our castle. Nice, <laughs> nice. I like it. I like it. I like it. Now, uh, in terms of the content that's coming from the former players, you know, as I know, you look at me and you think, well, Mark, you must have been a defensive lineman in the NFL, uh, but oddly enough, I wasn't. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I, I'm interested to hear the logic behind, you know, bringing in and using strictly former, former athletes to teach this content versus conceptually some other people that might be experts in their field that can teach it. Yeah. I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think we as athletes are slow to trust. <laughs> That's we've been taught not to trust really. Um, Cause there are a lot of sharks out there and we've, we've been taught all of the, all the uh, horror stories behind it. And so naturally when an athlete is speaking to us, we're more likely to actually listen or more actually, we're more likely to hear them out. And so 
Um, that is one thing. And then also, you know, frankly, as a, as a business, the star athletes have a lot of star power and mm-hmm. are very, um, it helps with marketing. You know, most athletes have, you know, really solid um, following. So it's, it's also, you know, better for business, but, you know, we, we, we do want to hold space also for experts who have a ton of experience in their particular field. Um, it just won't be our main focus moving forward. And I think that's one of the pivots that we made from when I first was was um, having a list of course partners who may not have been athletes, but had like, and actually moving towards something where it, it does feel a bit more like um, into that, younger version of themselves in a way that athletes understand using terms that only we really understand. Um, right. And yeah, gotcha. that's, that's kind of the thought process behind it. Okay. Um, naturally I disagree, but that's, that's off the record. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so look, I know that you got to jump in a minute. So I, I, before I let you go, I want to make sure that people know the best, what is the best way for people to reach you? And I guess just as importantly, who are some of the folks that you want to meet? In other words, if, people out here that are part of this today or listening uh, after the fact have people in their network. Who are the best people for you to meet right now? Um, well, people can read via LinkedIn. I think that's probably best. Um, okay. Sometimes Instagram, I, it, stuff gets lost in my DMs, but LinkedIn, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm pretty locked into. Mm-hmm. And Good. I would say we're getting ready to start a capital raise process. So, uh, we're going to need some money to produce these courses the way we want to. So um, investors and potential partners, we uh, another pillar of what we're building at postseason besides the community and the education department is we want to have a directory of resources to be able to send athletes to um, from, you know, clinical you know, trauma as what Scott was talking about a little bit yeah. earlier. Um mm-hmm financial wellness, you know, the different, the different elements, we want to be able to send them to, to the right people. And so I think all in all, I, I, I love connecting with individuals who share that same mission and, and align with that. So, yeah, I would say that. Good. And uh, so before I let you roll, just a couple of last little comments that here, uh, one, uh, Tim was asking, how are players finding you today, uh, especially with postseason? Is it, are you linking with the NFL or are they offering, to send you people or connections, or are they kind of saying almost feeling like you're a competitor or something? What's the end of oh, um, you know, I we when we <laughs> the NFL PA, we did get a little bit of like energy when we were talking to them, of like, oh, we got all this, we got all this, yep, we yep. got all this already, yeah. Um, but no, I think a lot of it has been the direct outreach building community via social media, but also. Um, just having conversations with the colleges and universities, that's mainly how we're going to be marketing is, is pretty much through the universities, through our social channels, yeah. um, through building community that way. Um, for the most part, I haven't found that the leagues and organizations have found us to be competitors. You get a, you get a, a little bit of that. Uh, but mm-hmm. overall, when we really explain what the problem is to, to everyone that, okay, this this has been going on for a long time. We felt like we had resources available to support this while they're playing, but you're right. There's nothing available for them when they stop playing and um, that needs to change. Gotcha. Um, well, look, I'm going to um, let you roll in a sec here and then I'm going to ask you a quick question right after we sort of sign off here. But um, I really appreciate you jumping in here. I know that uh, you're a super busy guy. You just finished moving homes. You've got a couple of kids that um, I think we're a little bit under the weather <laughs> and all kinds well. of things. Yeah. yeah. So you've been uh, juggling quite a bit. So thank you so much for sharing your time today. I really appreciate it, Jelani. No, I appreciate being there. And, if, and I know I have to run and I would love to have stayed and, and, and chat a little bit longer. So if anyone wants to continue the conversation, please reach out uh, on LinkedIn and we'll continue with. Um, I just have a, a meeting that I have to get to. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right. All right.